He's dead. Because the huge fund's been around for a long time. Okay? <laughs> and he was asked this question. When's a good time to invest? And here's his answer. When you have the money. You know, they thought they were going to... You know, market up, market down, market in flux, market, you know, alpha, beta, you know, intersect, you know, all that stuff. They're, he's like, no, you know, you invest when you have the money. You know what the hard, hardest part about investing is, you guys? Hardest. Hard. Get started. That's it. I've been doing this for 25 years. If I get you, what's your name? Zach. I love your haircut, buddy. I'm in the guard, and I, uh, my wife hates it when I do that. But I can't do this. I don't look at it. There was a guy in here last class. I just went to school here. It's like, oh, awesome. Like a good one. Anyway, um, what was I going to say? Is that all the time? Oh, yeah. If I, yeah, that's for sure. If I got you started on a, on a monthly investment plan, you'd do it till I die. Till I die. Not you, till I die. And then, my son, who is in my business, he'll take over and he'll make the buck 20 off of your 50 bucks until you stop putting it in. Once we get you started, people don't stop. As a matter of fact, you start at 50, and in, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, you'll be doing like four or $500 a month in your, why? Because, that gum, this works. Like, ooh, this one, market's down. Next quarter. Woohoo! Two quarters from now. Maybe I should call him. I'll tell you about that later. And I'll tell you now. If you call me when the market's down, I'll get more money from you. When do you buy? Why are you calling me? Because the market's down. Okay, that must mean you want to buy. <laughs> Where's your money? I'm going to go get it. They don't call me when the market's down. I'm Mr. Williams. Could you choose which stocks your mutual fund invests in? Can you choose which stocks? Now, we're assuming that everybody knows what a mutual fund is. Is that true in here? Oh, yeah. Really? What's a mutual fund? You a wrestler? Yes. Never mind. <laughs> hey, no, I wrestle. Actually, I used to go and flop around with him when he was wrestling. He used to beat the crap out of me. All right, you look smart. What's a mutual fund? Last time you look like that, huh? <laughs> mutual fund, you guys, is there's a there's a mutual fund management company, like, and I'm the manager, and here's my research team, yeah, maybe four or five. And you're all people that want to invest in the market. So you, you individually do your research and you find my fund, the, the, the fund that I'm managing, based on an objective. Our fund's objective, you guys, is to get capital growth over time with dividends. In other words, we want to go find companies that have a growth potential in the company. Okay, the value of the company is going to increase because of their products, their you know research and development potential, blah 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 blah. Okay, we're going to go we're going to go find those companies, and they pay the companies their stock has been paying some dividends over the years. Okay, that's our objective. That's so you guys are out there looking for a fund that growth potential and pays a little dividends. So you guys say, hey, I'm going to send you guys some money. Fill out a form, and we start tapping your checking account for 50 bucks, and yours for 200, and you're really rich, so you're doing 1,000 a month, and you're doing 75. Blah, 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 blah. So you send us all this money. We've done the research. We're going to go buy all those stocks that we researched that fit that objective, and we're going to put them in a pool, a mutual pool. So all of us mutually own the pool together. And there's a formula that they figure out that, okay, we decide that Walmart's going to be in, in, in the, the stock portfolio. Well, you don't own any Walmart shares. 
you own a fraction of all the Walmart shares that we buy based on how many shares of the mutual fund you own. So look at it like this. You ever hear the old saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket? Here's the picture. Farmer puts all his eggs in one basket, sticks on the back of the truck, drives into town, hits a pothole, the basket flies off the back, and he loses his investment. You got the picture? Here's a smarter way. This is a mutual fund. He gets 150 little baskets, sticks one or two eggs in each one, drives to market, hits the bump, a couple baskets fly off. He just, he just loses a couple. But then the rest of it make it to market, and he makes a profit. That's a mutual fund. Okay, you with me? So the question is, can you choose which stocks your mutual fund invests in? Yeah, you have to find a mutual fund that invests in the stocks that you want. But you're not dictating, you're not dictating to me which stocks I'm going to buy. I'm doing the research. My team is doing the footwork, visitations, analyzing, all that crap. Your job as an investor is if you want specific stocks, you've got to go find them. So go find a mutual fund that has that. All right. By the way, if you do, if you deal with me, I tell you what you want. You don't know what you want. Remember Luigi from Cars? You don't know what you want. I know what you want. Anyway, would it be smart to invest in the upcoming medical marijuana companies? I haven't given that any thought. I think we should sell Colorado to Mexico. Then we don't have to worry about it. Then it'll be an international thing. We don't have to worry about it. How much should I invest in each stock? I don't suggest that you start with stocks. I suggest you start with a mutual fund. Here's why. When you build a financial plan, one of the first things you take care of is retirement. Until you're maxing out your retirement funds, IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, the, the tax favored, by the way, you know the two things that kill seniors in retirement with their money? Two things. Inflation, they didn't count on it. Now they're screwed because they don't have enough money. And taxes. Here's what I ask people. Are taxes higher today than they were 30 years ago? 20 years ago? 10 years ago? Where do you think they're going to be 10 years from now? 20 years from now? They don't go down, people. Taxes, you want to either defer or avoid. And you can do that in some of these investment uh, products. But you have to, typically you have to work with someone who knows what they're doing so it doesn't take you forever to make a decision and get started. Okay. Um, by the way, you can do stocks if, here's the rule on buying and making money with stocks, and there's no guarantee you're going to make any money. You have to be able to spend a half an hour a week Per stock doing the research. I'm talking about ongoing, just keeping it. Because you don't make money holding stocks unless you're selling. And when do you do that? When they're up. And how do you do that? Follow. You spend the time. Yeah. yeah. Now with technology, it's a little bit easier because they can alert you on your phone and then you can you know, what a hassle you guys. I got other things to do. And I'm sure you do too. By the way, if you want to play the stock market, it's way more fun going to Vegas. Just put your money in a mutual fund. Let the managers take care of it. You just live your life. You just make the money. Remember, my pay as a mutual fund manager, which I'm not, you know, but I'm just saying, I'm pretending, is based on how well that fund does. So how well do I want the fund to do? How well do these guys want the fund to do or doing the research? My team, they get paid based on how well the fund does. So there's incentive there. I love that. I love that. No showing up and putting your time in, baby. You want to make money? You better work. What's your Social Security number? How much do you make a year? My Social Security number is in your freaking business. Hey, by the way, I can find out any of your Social Security numbers. You can find mine, too. It used to be so funny. People it used to be really funny about fill our forms out because you got to get a social number because we notify the IRS that you're, you know, opening up a tax deferred account. And they'd be like, uh, well, I'm really uncom like, I go like this, I go, ah, never mind, I can just find it on the internet. All right, well. 
that was back before the internet. Anybody knew anything about it? Hey, you're late. <laughs> how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. All right, you got any questions for a financial guy? Think about it. I'm coming back. Okay. You'll, you'll have one. <laughs> All right. Well, let me take you through a couple of concepts that I think you'll enjoy. Um, Is anybody here currently investing? How many of you are 18 years old? Okay. You're the only ones eligible to invest, by the way. You have to be 18 years old to, to hold a, uh, an investment. All right. As you leave school, get a job, you're going to be bombarded with um, financial products that you need to be able to handle and understand. Why do you think most people, I'm talking about most people, got most people, listen to me, most people are so screwed up financially. Is it because they wanted to be screwed up? Okay. Because they didn't start like, saving when they were younger and didn't know what well, people my age probably didn't know any of that stuff. It wasn't available. There's no internet. And unless you paid money to sit down with somebody. What I'm talking about, most people, you guys, I'm talking about 40 and older. Your generation, in my estimation, you guys have no excuse for not knowing. You can Google a word that you don't understand. Give it down. So, you don't have to go to the library. Shoot, when I got started in 1989, I heard about this uh, insurance thing. That's how I got started. I had to go to the library to find stuff about not only the company, but the concepts and the product. It was took forever. It's probably why the guy that recruited me into the business was so frustrated because it took me so long. Because I was a school teacher, I had to know everything. I gotta know everything before I do something. I gotta know everything. But you guys, just between you and me, hold on me. Just try. Just jump in. Life's too short, man. You don't need to know everything. Besides, I was telling one guy, he was asking me, one kid when he was leaving here, he's like, well, you know, what, what classes should I take if I want to get into this field? And I'm like, listen, you don't need any classes for any of this stuff. I mean, you do. But there's a difference between getting licensed and certified and being successful. And I don't care what field you go into, if you're going to rise above the bottom rung, you better learn how to deal with people, communicate with people, empathize with people, learn to manage and supervise gently other people. If you can get somebody to like you and trust you quickly, they'll give you a seven-figure check. Here's my example. I had a client who I helped. She had a coworker who was retiring at the same time. She recommended he come see me. He comes to my office, sits down, and he says, I just need you to know that you're competing with uh, Merrill Lynch and Dean Winter. Those are the other two places I've been. And because Barb said I should come see you, and you've done her such a great job, I'm giving you an opportunity to get my business. And I said, well, I appreciate that. So tell me about your work. Tell me about your, your family. So you're going to retire. What are you going to do? You guys, we talked for 45 minutes about him. So, you know, we got done, and I guess there was nothing else talk about in terms of the fuzzy stuff, he looks at me and he says, so who do I make this check out to? And I had no idea how much money he was talking. Barb just said he was retiring. And I knew Barb had about a half a million. So I'm figuring, yeah, probably about the same. And I said, well, there's no checks. We just were going to transfer. And he goes, I've made my decision. Now, he's never met me. 45 minutes, smiling talking, asking questions, being a person, 
not pushy, never mentioned investments, never talked about strategies. And he just filled the paperwork out. You do what you think is best. Okay, and then there's a box for amount. 1.1 million. Now you guys, you like that's a big number. I mean, that's a pretty good number. But you don't understand what that means to me. I got paid 30 grand for having a 45 minute conversation with a guy who liked me and trusted me. Because we talked about him. Now I did, I mean, even through the market downturns, it's been to well, 98, 99. His wife had almost 300,000, and he had another 250 in some IRAs. They all came. So it was almost, I think, 1.7 or 1.8 million total. It has paid him $100,000 a year for 14 or 17, I can't remember how long. And the value of that account is still about six or eight hundred thousand dollars. His wife's passed away since. So is it the schooling? Was it my incredible knowledge of the market and strategies? And I find and that taught me something. And unfortunately, it was that long ago because I changed my entire. I went. Oh. I changed my entire approach. As a school teacher, I would have thought that if I impressed you with how much I knew, that you'd do business with me. And the longer I talked, the more likely you were going to do business. <laughs> and I found out it's absolutely the opposite. I could take someone who knows nothing and teach them people skills, and they'll have the same thing happen. So anyway, life lesson. But also, I put that money in a portfolio that performed because I do know stuff. I was a teacher. I wanted to know everything. But he didn't need to know everything. He just needed to know that I knew. But number one, that I cared and that I was interest, more interested in him than I was his money. And, but his money paid for some of my kids to go to college. <laughs> All right, so you're going to leave here. You're going to be confronted with all this stuff. And most people, 40 and over, I'm talking most people, you guys, are screwed up financially. And it's not because they wanted to be screwed up. It's because they either made poor choices, no choices, or the wrong choice. And by the way, no choice is a choice. You're going to be confronted with things like, do I use credit cards? Here's what I told my children. I have four adult children. If I find out that you have credit card debt, I will not spend another dime on you or your family. Because in 25 years of being in business, it's the number one cause for divorce, psychoanalysis, turmoil, health issues, is excessive debt, and it starts with a credit card. Oh, I'll pay this off. Here's what happens. Oh, I really like that snowblower or that lawnmower or those are things I need to get or whatever. I don't really have the cash, but you know, I'm going to get a bonus at the end of next quarter. I'll just go ahead and get it, put it on the credit card, and I'll pay it off in three months. Got my new lawnmower, 2200 bucks. You know what happens next month? Two months away from bonus, one month into paying credit card payments, the car breaks. And it's $1,100 that I don't have. Well, it's an emergency. I, I have to put it on there. Hopefully, I'll be able to, maybe I'll pay that off and just make payments on the credit card. So two months goes by on the credit card payments. The bonus comes in and your daughter needs 
dental work. It's not covered by the health plan. And that's another $900 that you don't have. So you take $900, because you got to get the dental work. It's your daughter. You just, right? $900 off the bonus, which leaves uh, $1,200 to pay for the car repair, to pay that off the credit card. But now you're still stuck with the $2,200 that you paid for the lawnmower that you were going to pay off with the bonus in the first place. And it never stops. The dryer breaks, tire blows out, the roof leaks, the kid gets sick, your kid gets really sick. I told him, I said, you go down that path, you're done. I will, I will not give you another dime. Now, they will never tell me they have credit card debt. <laughs> they will never ask for money to pay off credit cards. Right? The reason people get craned with credit cards, you guys, is because they don't understand how debt works. Did you guys know there are six different ways that banks calculate an interest rate? I mean, if you borrowed $1,000 and they said your interest rate's 10%, in your mind, do the math. What, what's it going to cost you? 10% of 1,000 is 100 bucks. And you would think, if I pay that back over um, 12 months, that'd be $88, let's see, 10, 80, 88, $89.20 a month would be a thousand bucks. You with me? Or $1,100. That's not how credit cards work. It's a hundred dollars today. It's a hundred and two cents tomorrow. It's a hundred and eight cents the next day. It's 120 cents the next day. You get me? You know? And if you send the, the 92, $91, at the end of 12 months, you still owe half the half of what you borrowed. If there are six different ways to calculate an interest rate and you don't know all six, do you think the banks know all six? Everybody go like this. Do you think the banks know? that you don't know all six, because we're Americans, Americans don't do math, do you think the banks might take advantage of you for that? Every day. That's how they make their money. They're hoping you can't figure it out. That's why there's a lot of paperwork. Fine print. It's too much trouble. I just filed bankruptcy. That's a whole other game. Installment loans. You guys know what an installment loan is? It's a way to calculate an interest rate. It was the first way, an installment loan. You're going to borrow $1,000, you're going to charge you 10%, you're going to pay it back over 12 months. At the end of the 12 months, you've paid everything back. Did you guys know that at the beginning of an installment loan, it's almost all interest? In other words, you pay all the interest first, and then you pay the principal. Each payment becomes more and more principal at the back end. That's how, and by the way, you never use credit cards, you use debit cards for the internet and all that stuff you guys need to have cards for. Debit, tied to your checking account. The cash isn't in there, you don't buy it. But an installment loan, and you, so you never use credit cards, but an installment loan is, is a type of loan you would use to buy a car. So what if you had $30,000, you could pay cash for a car, would you do it? You wouldn't have a car payment, you're a fool. You don't use your own money to buy stuff that depreciates. When you buy a new car and you drive it off the lot, what's the value? Just say less. Since you drive it off, you, you've lost value. You use other people's money for that kind of stuff. Mortgages, on the other hand, because most people don't have $200,000 to drop, you use other people's money, but it appreciates. That's why you do it for a long period of time. It appreciates in value, which means I buy it at 100, and 30 years from now it's worth 250. That's a that's a good use of debt. An installment loan on a car is a good thing because 
uh, the thing you're purchasing decreases in value if you're using other people's money. If you had 30 grand, here's what I'd teach you. Let's put it in an investment and have it make your payment for you. If your investment's making 6% and the loan's only 3, is that good for you? You're up by 3%. You're growing, right? Strategies, but you got to do math. Or you can just come talk to someone like me and I'll take care of you. We'll talk about your family. Right. Um, mutual funds. Anybody here know what a mutual fund is? Oh yeah, we do that. The savings accounts, anybody know what the going rate of the bank is right now, savings accounts? Anybody, anybody, anybody? Ferris, go ahead. Yeah, like one tenth of one percent or less. If inflation's three percent and the bank's giving you point nothing, which way are you going? You're going backwards. Everybody, everybody knows what inflation is, right? <clears throat> Coffee, you know what inflation is? No, yes, maybe. Inflation is the deterioration of your purchase power. Here's an example. 1977, when I got my driver's license. I got, no, I got in 76. A gallon of gas was 38 cents. And during the crisis in the early 70s, it went up to like 80. Ooh. What's a gallon of gas today? 350 to 380. But wait a minute. A gallon of gas is it still a gallon? Is it put in your vehicle to move it from here to here? Yes. So the product's exactly the same, but the price has gone way up. Well, if you're, pay if you're paying 100 times more for gas, what, what aren't you paying for? Because the more your budget's going for gas. What about cell phones? Did we have those 30 years ago? How about cable? Internet access. You guys, my cell phone bill is $280 a month. That was two car payments 30 years ago. My first car payment was $152 a month for a Plymouth Horizon. I let some guys from the theater shop paint it. So he took the hood off, set it against the wall. It was that building next to OJ that used to sit out there. That's where they did it. And they stripped it and primed it. And they were going to put this deep black lacquer finish, you know, paint job on it. <laughs> they had to move it for some reason. He turns the key, and this was before they had safety. It was a clutch, you know, stick. Turns it, lurches forward, crushed the hood. You were having to paint it for you, or was it going to go into play? No, no, they just wanted to do it for me. All these guys used to do all kinds of, well, I did tons of stuff for those kids. Yeah. I got them to colleges, drove them around, I did all kinds of stuff. They were just trying to do something nice, and they destroyed my car. <laughs> I sold it to one of those kids for 500 bucks. It was a tank yeah. in one of the blue tip parades. Oh, memories. I told you I used to teach you, right? Yeah, I used to have the same look from a lot of my students, but not for long. So I'd get their face and make it All right, and then 401ks. What's a 401k? No idea. Go home and ask, you mom and dad at home? Go home and ask them if you want to have a 401k. And then see what they say, because here's what a 401k is. It's tax code! Everyone thinks it's an investment. It's just tax code. In other words, it tells the employer how to treat, or it tells the IRS how to treat the gains in that account tax-wise. They're tax deferred, and there's limits on how much you can put in. 401k is just section, IRS section 401, subparagraph K. IRA is under the same section, but labeled individual retirement account under the same retirement provisions of the IRS tax code. 
So I know you don't know what you're talking about when you ask me, so what are your IRAs paying? What do you mean, what's the tax code paying? I don't get it. Oh, you mean what can, what vehicles are available as IRAs? Oh, well, it can be a passbook savings account, it can be a CD, it can be an annuity, it can be a stock, it can be a mutual fund. 401ks are offered by for-profit employers. That's all that that section of the IRS code says. 403b, section 403 sub, is for non-profit organizations like schools, hospitals, for their employees to be able to save money for retirement on a tax-deferred basis. What's the difference between tax-deferred and tax-free? No? Nobody? Go ahead. Uh, tax the rest floor! Yeah! Tax deferred is where you pay your taxes uh, all at once. It's taxed as you All right, stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking you down, buddy. You're close, but you're confused. It has to do with how you pay your taxes. Deferred means when you defer, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? You defer. Putting it off. You're putting no. You're putting paying taxes till later. Till later means when you spend the money later. So in other words, your employer says we're going to pay you money to work here. All right, that's this much. If you so choose, we will pay you. Watch my hands. No, nope, you got to watch here. Right here. We will pay you this much in cash. Put it right in your checking account. And this little bit over here, we will put into your 401k plan, which at most companies is the options of where to put the money is in mutual funds. Okay? That money stays there and grows until you're at least 59 and a half when you can take it without penalty by the IRS, or you retire, which you would be foolish, I mean, it might be hundreds of thousands of dollars by then, you'd be foolish to take it all out and pay all the taxes because you'd be in the highest tax bracket. That, that would be silly. You would say, all right, um, send me two grand a month. And then you would pay taxes on $24,000 that, that year. Does that make sense? That's called tax deferred. Tax free means no taxes. You don't pay any taxes. The only vehicle out there that, that allows you to do that is a Roth IRA. Senator Roth, in 1996, got an amendment to the IRS code that says, if you put your money in this type of account, the employer says, we're going to pay you this much money, and it goes right into your checking account. It's all been taxed. Okay? If you want to put money into a tax-free vehicle, Okay, the money's already been taxed once, right? Got taxed when, when they paid it to you. I, as an employee, as a worker, I can choose then to send money from my checking account, already been taxed, to my Roth IRA. Which, by the time I'm ready for retirement, 20, 30, 40 years from now, can be substantial. It could be a million, two million dollars tax free. So in other words, during that 40 years, I may have only put in $100,000 of my own money, but because it was in the market, it's grown to one or two million tax. You guys don't understand how important tax is. How many of you draw a paycheck right now? No, no paychecks? Here's the biggest wow. Don't tell me if I'm wrong. Here's the biggest wow. You get your first paycheck, and you're figuring I get paid 10 bucks an hour, and I put in 10 hours, I should get paid 100 bucks. You get your paycheck and you go, I only got $72. How, how could I, what? What are all these FICA, state, local, Medicare? Those are all taxes. So they take 28, 30% to give away to other people. If 
you're working in the United States, if you add up all your taxes, by the way, you know you're paying about 48% of every dollar goes in taxes. So how important is having a tax-free account? Make the difference between making it or not when you're not working anymore. And it's part of my investment strategy for all my clients. Okay? And then bank accounts, which we already talked about. Now, what's the most important thing about investing? It's the most important and it's also the hardest. What's the hardest? Getting started. I'm telling you, all my clients, all my young clients, once I get them started, they stick with it. Secondly, um, how much should you do? You should do no less than 10%. That, that's if you just want to go to McDonald's when you're retired. But you should start at 25%. 25% of your income should go towards retirement. That's if you want to retire at my age. I mean, if you want to work until you're 70 or 75, yeah, do 10%, that's fine. I mean, you'll get there, hopefully you live that long. Dad, come on, I got grandbabies! And they're a lot of fun. I can't wait till they get to be teenagers like the torture. Think that might happen? The torture or that I make it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, 11.03 is this class. Okay. Well, I already did his questions. So yeah. I, I can talk right up to the bell. All right. Here's a basic concept you need to understand. Two largest investors in mutual funds, banks and insurance companies, where do they get their money? From all of you. Right? What does a bank make? Do they make anything? Do they sell stuff? Do they hammer out dollars in that vault? They don't make anything except money. Whose money do they use? Yup. So the two largest investors in mutual funds are banks and insurance companies, and they're using your money! Quit doing that! Here's what happens. Take your money, you give it to the banks, they immediately turn around and either lend it back to you in the form of a credit card, car payment, or a mortgage, or they invest it. Now, the market's averaged about 10.8%, or I'm sorry, 11.4% for the last 89 years. Well, what difference does that make? They understand the rule of 72. Anybody take calculus in here? Differential equations? Yeah, I mean neither. But I did look this up because I was an English teacher. What do English teachers do? They look stuff up. You know what's even better? They make you look stuff up. <laughs> Rule 72, here's how I relate it to the masses. I use my fingers. Hey, just be thankful I don't make you do this. Rule 72 says this if you have a dollar, and you invest it at 1%. It'll take 72 years, a long time, for the $1 to become $2. You with me? $1, 1%, 72 years, it'll double. Therefore, any interest rate that you divide into the factor of 72 will give you the number of years it takes for money to double at that interest rate. So interest rate does matter. Where you put your money matters. If you get 4% on your money, it takes 18 years for that to double. 6% is 12 years, 12% 12 is 6 years. Why is that important? Well, if you had $10,000 and you put it at 4%, after a working lifetime, you'd have 40 grand. If you had the same $10,000, but you put it over here where you could get a 6% rate of return, it grows to 80. Isn't that weird? 2% increase, but it doubles the return. Watch what happens here. You double the return, does it just double? Do you see why banks and insurance companies are the wealthiest industry in the world? Do you see what they do with your money? 
You can't let them do that. You have to go into the market in a good, high quality mutual fund and make those types of returns yourself. Now, one of the other concepts that's important to think about. Did we talk about this already? All right. I've done three now. I keep losing track. So when I talk to people about putting money in, uh, in, into the market, and they're young, like you guys, you know, you're in what they call the accumulation phase of your life. What happens is I show them a history, a historical of maybe a fund that I want to I want to use, and so what this is this is a historical here's zero, and here are the rates of return by year 2001 two three four five six you with me, and this year was up 10 percent, this year is down minus eight, this year was up to 16, this year is minus 15, up here it was 21, down here is minus four, and up there it was plus 36. What are the best <coughs> three years for you? What would be the best three years? Okay, you're in the accumulation phase of your life. Go ahead. Uh, like, maybe like 16, 21, 10, 30, 30. Yep, and if you were older, you would be right. But as a young person in the accumulation phase of your life, no. The best years for you are here. All these ones. Why? Prices are down. You're buying. Listen, if you went to the store to buy shoes, and there was a rack that had beautiful shoes, just what you love, just love them, and they said, reduce, two for one. And then there was another rack here that had the exact same shoes on it, and it said, price twice as marked. Which rack are you buying your shoes from? A two for? Because it's a bargain, right? It's a deal. It's a discount. Well, and you're in the accumulation phase and you're buying systematically, it's called dollar cost averaging, you really want the market to be down more than it's up. Because when the market's down, that means prices are down and you buy more shares. Why is that important? Because if you're buying more shares, how do they pay? <coughs> how do they pay dividends? Based on what? Number of shares you own. Anybody play Monopoly? Are we in Monopoly? Did I ask that question? No. No? Monopoly. You guys haven't played Monopoly. You know what a Monopoly is. Yes, we're going like this, we're going like what? You do? Wrestler? He knows? It's Monopoly. He or she that owns the most property makes the most money. And they win. Investing is the same way, you guys. But you can't accumulate a lot of shares if you're always buying high. Here's what I hate. Oh, the market's bad. Bad. I can't go in. Bad. It's bad. It's really bad. Oh, did I tell you how bad it was? It's bad. That's the best time to go in. Matter of fact, when it's bad, buy more. Because that means prices are down. Here's what we learned about the market, you guys. When it goes down, what else do we know? It's going to go back up. Always has, always will. Sorry, didn't even wake you. What? <laughs> All right, any questions about this? You guys understand why buying low is important? Buying low. But when do you know if it's going to be low? You don't. That's why you get started on a systematic investment plan where you spend the same amount of money every month on the same day and you buy no matter what the share price is. Some months the share price will be here, some months it will be here. When it's down here, you buy more shares. By the way, mutual funds is the only place you can buy fractions of, sh of shares. It'll let you buy like half a share or a quarter of a share, 0.762% of a share. Depends on how much money you're putting in. But dollar cost averaging is a winning, a winning strategy. Now, if any of you are interested, how many of you are 18? Did I ask? All right. If you're interested in starting your own mutual fund, my card's up here. Help yourself. 
when we get together, you have to be 18 years old to, to get a, an investment. And I'm looking for new reps. I have an office downtown Wadsworth. And if you're 18 and going to graduate this year, um, maybe we can get started in the summertime. Or if you know somebody who's looking for either a part-time position or a career change, um, take a card and give it to them. Have them give me a call. Go ahead. Any other questions? Is that your question sheet in front of you? Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Read one. Number one tip to becoming a successful investor. Get started. That's number one. Number two, use somebody that knows what they're doing. Don't ask the guy that you work next to, you're 25 and he's 65, hey, what should I invest in? And he tells you what he's investing in and then you do it. He's 65, that's a completely different portfolio than 25. When you're 25 and you're planning for retirement, you can be aggressive. When you're 65, you can't be. I had a client that um, moved from one company to another after being someplace for like 20 years. They had a 401k. Well, if you don't move that, they just leave it. Well, she quit opening up the, the envelopes that she was getting because it was always the same. Well, one of those envelopes said, hey, we're moving the 401k. You need to make an investment option. Otherwise, we're going to put you in a money market. She was in there for 10 years, lost $180,000 in investment potential. They put her in a money market. Bye, you guys. Hey, come back again tomorrow. <laughs> they will.